accommodating me. I appreciate that. And I'm super glad to be here uh, with you in Tel Aviv today. Um, it's a kind of weird time in my own life. I spent my whole adult career uh, at the New York Times. Uh, and I left earlier this year, uh, and I have I have no new work to talk to you about. Uh, so I will talk to you uh, mostly, almost entirely, about uh, about New York Times work and about the data visualization uh, that happened there. Uh, that was both print and web, like the examples you see behind me. But now I feel like I'm an outsider uh, looking in on it in the same way that some of you are outsiders looking in onto onto this onto this window. Uh, and when I think about data visualization work, uh, sometimes I think of it as kind of like you have this little DJ board in front of you, uh, and I know nothing about DJing, right? But it's just that like you have so many choices, right? Near the end of my career at the Times, uh, I was editing both words uh, and people who were making graphics. Uh, and the thing about graphics that was interesting to me was just so right out of the gate, uh, it was like just the canvas was blank and open and it felt like you just had so many knobs and like some of the knobs were like easier the things like about color but some of the knobs are entirely about like what even is the form of this thing right as opposed to like when you're writing words when you're writing an essay like you can go lots of directions but you know i'm going to open my document and i'm going to start to start with words i know the form right out of the way and when i think about that dj board about all the choices that you have uh, when you're when you're crafting these things, when you're making something, um, there's three of them uh, that I think are especially interesting. Or you know, if I only got to take three knobs with me, uh, I think my knobs, uh, the knobs that I would want to keep, are abstraction, uncertainty, and story. Uh, and those are the things that I wanted to talk to you about today, about those characteristics in data visualization. So what do I mean by abstraction? Um, you know, many people who are smarter than I am have thought deeply about this. Uh, this is Scott McCloud, who's done a lot of work in understanding comics uh, and saying that, like, uh, when we're uh, by stripping down an image, uh, we can amplify meaning uh, in a way that realistic art cannot. So, in some ways, maybe that you can can increase actual connectivity uh, by getting rid of some detail that you can see yourself in things in ways you couldn't uh, with actual detail. Uh, he's not the first smart person to think about it either. You know, you know the Picasso trying to capture the essence of the bull. Uh, how much abstraction is the right abstraction? I started thinking about this in my own career at that uh, at the time, super early. Uh, this is a a piece by one of my colleagues, Graham Roberts, about this violin, and he spent he spent days or weeks rendering this violin, um, and I was like, why don't you just take a picture of a real one, right? Like, uh, in some ways, like, what have you what have you abstracted away? Um, and I was thinking about it in my own type of work. I came from a more of a statistical background, um, and so I was making pictures like this one, which and this is a is a scatter plot actually of how much oil the world has consumed. Uh, and against the price of oil, uh, the idea being when the price of oil goes up, people people drive less, people make other choices, people consume less, um, and so so it turns around. And I like this one in part because one weekend uh, I got a call from ca call from a copy editor as they were trying to close the Sunday paper, and it was like. Can we just get rid of that loop? Uh, he said, "I, I will cut the story, which was a big deal at the time. The time that like, the, I will make the words much less important. I'll get rid of them. I'll throw them away for your graphic. I'll give you a whole nother column in the newspaper, if you can just stretch this graphic uh, and get rid of that loop. Uh, just um, which it's fun because it's fun to think about. If you think of the graphic as like made of string or something, you know, if you stretched it far enough, uh, you would get rid of this loop. Uh, but the graphics made of pixels so if you stretched it it would you never get rid of the loop uh, but it was also an idea about like possibly uh, or pushing too far on the abstract in this in this one right like the idea of like there's something about the charm of this example in that the loop is like the whole fun in that like the price of oil goes up too much and then like consumption slows that's what this rise is and it actually turns around that's what that is uh, but you know that it's so abstract that like do people actually understand it? Like they certainly understand it in a different way uh, than the like more conventional, uh, uh, just straight line charts that you're used to seeing. Uh, I've also learned about abstractions from some of my other colleagues. Um, 
This is an example from Jonathan Quorum, who made the science graphics of the times. This isn't actually his example. This is academic work he was inspired by. Uh, and it's about how this one is a chart of a, of a whale feeding. Uh, it's actually an accident. They'd stuck some sensors to a whale and were trying to measure something and caught it feeding by accident and learned some things they didn't expect to learn. Um, and this is Jonathan's uh, actual uh, take on that chart, uh, trying to make that same that chart of the whale feeding uh, more accessible to people. And when I think about abstraction in it, I think it's tempting to think of the illustrations uh, as the thing that is getting less abstract. Um, you know, when I look at this right away, when I look at Jonathan's version, I know right away, oh, these ideas are about whales in some way. Like, I get it. I get it right away. But I think the clever and the more subtle and the more interesting version of the abstraction that Jonathan has gotten rid of is that he's decided to show the whole whale feeding, right? Uh, when you look at the original academic paper, most of the chart was not interesting to the academics uh, because it was just it's just white space essentially like it's just uh, it's just space that and so like you say just cut it I don't care like it's not it's not the frontier of knowledge it's not the thing but there's something about showing it all that makes it intuitive right away that says like oh I get it like I get the depth of this uh, in a way I might not have otherwise and so when I think about abstraction I think about uh, choices like this, about choices like saying, let me allow you to show the boring parts too, uh, so that it feels intuitive right away, so you get a sense right away of like, oh, I can understand how deep that is. Uh, for a while, while I was reading the New York Times, I was highlighting the parts that were actually new to me, the information that I didn't actually know before. And I think that thinking about that ratio is fun in your own life and thinking about like how much of my work and the work that I want to share with other people should be kind of boring background parts so that we have something to scaffold onto, so that we have something to attach it to. Uh, and I think that's super relevant for data visualization. A different kind of example of that. Um, this is what America looks like, and it's basically just like a pole. Um, uh, if you, uh, and it's fun, I think, at least to just like stare at these people, to stare at their faces, to get a sense of, uh, you know, what the country is. But uh, while we're doing this, uh, in one part, there's some women named Sharon down here. Uh, and there's uh, these people, like at some academics, they gather them all for a weekend and they're chosen to be representative and it's like their big thing is that uh, they want the poll to actually be like truly representative so they work super hard to get people to attend uh, and and their like classic story is that like one time someone said they couldn't come because they had to milk their cow and they're like we'll find someone to milk your cow like uh, no and so but when you think about that when you think about the lengths that they are going to to try to get people there uh, they've chosen the sample in a way that, so that they could like go knock on people's doors. And so that has some consequences. Like we noticed that these photographs, there's like two women from named Sharon from this small town in Vermont. That's a town that has like 5,000 people. And that, that just feels like a correction for sure. Like that just feels like a mistake. But it's actually a consequence of how these people were sampled and how like the cow like milking program had to go because they went to a small town to knock on doors. But when I think about this, when I look at this, I look at it in a different way than I look at a normal poll. Um, of course, these are people's opinions might not be actually representative of all of America. Of course, there's going to be some brokenness in this. Of course, there's some people who are like always going to refuse to go. And I think dialing down the abstraction on this poll helps you think about, uh, this is where they live, helps you think about like what a poll even is. Uh, and helps you think about like and get the idea that there are, there are real humans behind these things. One more example of real humans behind this so, these sort of things in abstraction, because I don't always think it has to end in faces. I think you can dial down the abstraction a ton, even if you still end up showing points or lines or dots or something like some super abstract shape. So each of these dots. Uh, is a boy who grew up in America and who grew up in a rich family, who grew up in the top quintile. Um, the yellow ones are white boys, uh, and the black ones, or the blue ones, are black boys. Um, and so you can see there's kind of a pattern, right? So the, for the, the rich white boys, uh, their wealth is kind of protected. Um, the yellow dots kind of stay in those top kind of top top two quintiles, like you know. And the the blue dots, the black boys, um, 
they are more likely to fall. You see them like kind of represented in like going down the income ladder um, in, in some of these shapes. You know, they end up being where rich black boys end up as adults, they end up, their income ends up being kind of just random. They're equally distributed across the whole income distribution. Uh, in this form, it's quite abstract, right? Like it's talking about money, which is an abstract concept, um, but we've arranged it in the quintiles that kind of matches uh, our, our conception of like climbing an income ladder. The dots are super abstract, right? We're not showing faces of people. We don't have the actual people, but I still like this one. And I think it's a great example of uh, abstraction and how it captures the data. And to show you that, I'll show you some other versions you might have done. This is the table that came out of the original academic paper, um, summary statistics. Um, here, I am showing it in a different way. I'm showing like, you know, here, uh, I don't show you the motion of it. I just show you on one axis, here's their income when they grew, were a child, and the other axis, here's their income when they're an adult. And one thing is likely, and the color represents the relative likelihood of that. Same idea, but instead of using color, I use height uh, to show the relative likelihood of that. Maybe I give up and don't show them all and show them as lines. Maybe I give up the resolution and instead of showing 100 income buckets, I just show you like five income buckets and I bring, you know, something's different there, but I can't tell you what it is. But I think all of these examples, right, they're not intuitive. Like, it's not fair because I haven't put like true legends on it and I haven't like actually described what it is and I haven't put all the words on it. But the version that we published comes closer to matching this mental model of what is it that we're trying to show. And what is it that we're trying to show is we're trying to show like kids climbing ladders. And we talked about that. We talked about like, should we just get a video camera and a gym and finally some kids climb some ladders for us? And, and that seemed hard and like it was going to involve lawyers and it was just work. <laughs> um, uh, but the version that we show, the version of those yellow and blue dots, I think it is a version that's still highly abstract, but still captures the uniqueness of the data. And so what's unique in this data is that it's longitudinal. It like captures people over at different points in their life. It follows them over their life. And the form that we ended up using respected that. And a, a ton of my very favorite data visualization does that. It captures something that's unique about the data. So the unique thing about this data it flows over time. It follows individuals over time. We choose a form that flows over time and follows individuals over time. So I think it is less abstract in that it matches the, our mental models of what these things are, but it's still highly abstract uh, in, in its actual, it's just dots, it's just dots representing something. So that's knob one, uh, abstraction. Uh, knob two, uh, one thing that is close to my heart um, is about uncertainty. How do we say things that we don't actually totally know? I think all of the most interesting questions in the world are probably things that we like don't actually really know the answers to. Um, and I came to the times before I joined, I came from a statistics background. I thought getting better at this would be my great contribution to the world, and it turns out it's so hard, it's not gonna be my great contribution to the world. Uh, but I still have some lessons that come out of that. I talked about some of these at our workshop yesterday. Um, the classic example that I point, point to when I talk about this is about uh, election results and how we show election results on election night, uh, how we track the vote actually on election night. Uh, it's the most trafficked night uh, in American news media. Uh, and I think it's, it's so goofy because all of the data we have for all of that night or not all of the night, but most of the night, the vast majority of it, it means nothing, right? Because of the way votes are reported, it's just like a stream of meaningless numbers, right? Um, and so we can we track them over time. Here's one particular state that was quite important in the last election, and it says, you know, here's uh, the Democratic candidate in blue, and here's the Republican candidate in red, and we can see how those changed over the course of the night. Um, and it doesn't, here's an artist, like his conception of one of those for several different states. And I think that the art is fun because it really respects the idea that like the shape of these things it has no actual meaningful information in it right like you could shuffle them around you could show a totally different picture and that's charming and yet uh, if you know a ton of things about what is behind those lines like what are the places that have been counted what are the places that have reported their votes and where did those votes come from there is some information in this and so we've tried a lot to try to do better 
Um, this is an illustration of what we are trying to do. We say like, here, this map in the upper left, here is a place where, you know, it's a certain state. That's a place where a bunch of votes have already been counted. And then we know some other stuff. We have a guess about where there's votes that are left to be counted. We don't know exactly what, how many of them there are. And we don't know exactly what, who those people voted for. But we have, based on history, you can kind of make an educated guess. And so in this example, these blue dots that are left over that are uncounted, those are the suburbs around Washington, DC, the nation's capital. And they're always, every single election, those places are just so slow to count. They're just like really slow counters there. Uh, and they're also really democratic. So you know if you're watching election results in this place, in the state of Virginia, uh, they're always going to be not democratic enough uh, until the very end. Uh, and so that's what we've done in this, in this line chart at the bottom. We've said, look, if you look at the solid line, that's just the votes that have been counted so far. You look at this dotted line, that's both the votes that have been counted so far and our guess about what's left. So it's just a guess. It's not a fact. Uh, it just comes out of a model. It comes out of how places have voted in the past. It's just a guess. It says, like, I know this many people live around the nation's capital. I know those places are really democratic, but I don't know the actual result. Uh, and so the goal is, when, the, when those places are actually counted, for our dotted line here to be, to be as flat as possible. Um, and so that was, a, that was a successful night of that. And yet, uh, in some ways, like these lines, I think they, they're failing some of our abstraction tests. They're like too abstract. One, I don't feel the uncertainty in it. Right? Like, I don't feel the idea that the second, other half of it is just a guess, that I don't know the true answer uh, in it. Uh, and two, uh, I don't actually, like, you know, even me trying to explain it to you and as people who I think are probably like, not the most familiar with American elections, like, it's not fun, right? Like, I don't, I don't get it right away. It's like, it takes a lot of wind up, whatever. And so we tried like different forms. This is one that we tried before the 2016 election, where it's just like, uh, we just show you a couple of faces and then one will become clear or not. And that was obviously a terrible, horrifying idea. <laughs> um, and uh, so we ended up actually like uh, going something like more like this, where we just say like, let me just tell you, let me just tell you like what I think, uh, what I think the answer is. Let me get rid of all of this trappings of like uh, where it comes from and what it is, and let me just think. Um, let me just try to tell you like as clearly and as intuitively as we can like what our what our best guess is at a single point and there's going to be some uncertainty around that and so we don't really know for sure and so we use ended up using this form um out of the out of the 2016 election um and uh a lot of people hated it and um and it's because it gave them an answer and it told them an answer for something that they uh they maybe didn't want to know, and they felt it in a different way than they felt about the map uh, changing colors in a certain way. And my colleague Gregor uh, uh, came out of this thinking that there, he was, his lesson was uh, there is no soft display of uncertainty. That uh, if you want to tell me, uh, if you give me a point estimate like we're doing here, uh, and give me a range of things that are going to be possible, uh, the, uh, right away I'm going to want to ignore the range of things that are possible. Uh, I'm only going to focus too much mentally or overweight in my mental head the idea of just what the, what the actual raw answer is. And I think there's a lot of things worth thinking about in that. The other thing that I thought about about uncertainty uh, and learned about is that sometimes I think we ca try to capture the wrong types of uncertainty. Um, in the classic example uh, is sort of every month in the United States, there's a jobs report. It says like, the country gained this many jobs this month or lost this many jobs this month, uh, and the unemployment rate is, is this percent. Uh, uh, this many people would like to be working with that. It's kind of, I think, the, like, the way, it's the most real-time way, like as a country, we have to like, track the state of the economy as a whole. Uh, but it comes out of a survey, right? And like we saw in that survey of those faces of like 526 Americans that represent all Americans, we know like kind of the classic, the ideas that like surveys have some error in them and they might not measure, it. you know, if you tried it again, you might get a different answer. Uh, so we often focus on kind of those like confidence interval versions of uncertainty. Uh, but I think uh, there's also like more interesting versions of uncertainty and that often we don't actually really care about this data. We care about the ideas represented behind the data. And so 
This example was the last jobs report before an election. Uh, and so these are the charts that we usually make for the jobs report. We kind of just phone them in. They're like standard fine charts. Uh, and they're fine charts, but they're just boring. They're like whatever. And so we said, what would you do if we were going to try a little bit harder this month? And so what we decided to do is we decided to give people a couple of pairs of goggles to read this chart. Uh, and we said, if you're a Democrat, you can put on your Democrat goggles. Um, <laughs> You can say, look, uh, there have been 31 consecutive months of job growth, uh, and the unemployment rate has fallen more than two percentage points since its recent peak. Uh, if you're a Republican, you could put on your Republican goggles, uh, and you could say, look, uh, the economy needs to add 150,000 jobs a month just to keep up with population growth, uh, and the unemployment rate has been above 8% for 43 months now. The reason I like these examples is that, like, all of those statements are totally true, right? Like you don't have to spin it, you don't have to like start to look at different data, you don't have to start to question the data at all. Uh, but the interpret and the and the annotations are relatively simple too. Here, you know, we're either putting words on the chart and drawing an arrow, or we're adding a little bit of color, or we're adding some benchmark line. Like they're all like relatively simple, straightforward things but they totally change the interpretation of what this means. And I think that kind of uncertainty is really interesting uncertainty too. It's not the statistical sort of uncertainty, it's not the uncertainty of like, you know, your classic, like let me draw you a confidence interval on this chart. Uh, but I think it's really powerful because what you really care about is what does this data mean? Um, and that sort of like, that meaning uncertainty is the uncertainty that I think is, is quite interesting too. Um, one more different type of example of uncertainty uh, entirely. Um, there is, uh, you know, we often think of uncertainty, like I said, in the context of, uh, in the context of poll stuff. Um, and, and I think the sadness of poll stuff is, relates to some of the ideas we're talking about, about abstraction, is that it like doesn't really, you don't really feel the humanity of people in it. Um, and so this is an example from a, a couple years ago now, where I said, what could we do in a poll to like help feel the humanity of people, to help, you know, more than like, you know, and so, and what does like, what can everyone do, basically? And so like, we were like, you know, we talked about different things about like, tell me the emojis on your phone, like many people, not everyone has a phone, but a lot of people do, or you know, give me a picture of your kids, not everyone has kids, but a lot of people do. And where we, where we landed was, give me a picture of your refrigerator. Um, and so, uh, you know, can I guess, and then, you know, we asked our readers to say, like, tell me, is this a, is this a Trump quiz or a fridge, or, do, or does this refrigerator belong to a, a Biden household? Um, and so, um, you can guess for a little bit while. Um, and so I'm 0 for 2 so far. Um, I don't know. Um, and we can keep going, but we don't need to. But the magic of this, really, I believe, uh, is that uh, this has been reset at some point. I think we have like 200 million guesses overall, like some people played forever. Um, but even even with the 200 million guesses, it's the same percent, right? That like uh, America, our readers were able to guess the correct answer 50, 52% of the time. So basically a coin flip. And I think that's really beautiful. I think that idea is actually really cool that, uh, you know, I think we have stereotypes about each other, and we think, uh, you know, depending on what which of these candidates you prefer, um, you know, you you have these sort of, I don't know, whatever, stereotypically things, um, and uh, the idea that we can't do better, right? Like that they're all essentially just people at some sort. Uh, but there are some of our readers who don't can't appreciate the beauty of that at all, and so I think appreciating some of the beauty of that of the of, of the impossibility of the unknown, I think is, is something that I would like to, uh, I'd like, still like to get better at. And it's a different form of uncertainty too. That there is something really cool in that, that there's no signal in this, right? Like often we're excited by signal, but there's also something really cool here that there's no signal. So uh, that's point two. Uh, and my last dial, uh, something about story. I was thinking about story a lot, especially earlier in my career. Uh, if we stick in presidential election land, we were making, starting to make a lot of things that were basically interfaces. Um, this is a map of election results. Uh, the red part's stronger for one candidate, the blue part's stronger for another. And we do a bunch of things about them, like we'd put, like, we'd put 
selectors on it. So you could say, like, let me filter to the counties with this type of unemployment rate or this kind of manufacturing or this sort of racial composition. And we'd put sliders on it um, where you could, like, you know, dial those in even closer and the histogram would dance. And we're essentially just making interfaces. Uh, and there was something about this that, like, felt foreign to me from the land of journalism in the sense that, like, you know, on an important news day, a news day where the headline spans six columns, uh, we never title it, like, here are some words, I hope you find something interesting. And people would argue, like, oh, the web is different. Like, and I'd say, like, no, oh, it looks silly on the web, too, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense on the web, either. Um, and, uh, and so uh, when I look at that map, um, when you look at that map and you say, and you, you could see, like, I think it's our job as journalists to tell you what is interesting in it. So a good classic one is there's this, like, there's this crescent, this crescent shape in the south always in, in maps of American election results. Um, and at this time, uh, you know, at the, one of these examples, one of our readers said, like, oh, I kind of recognize that shape. That's kind of like my research. Here's what cotton production was like in the 1860s. Um, and someone else puts them together and says, like, oh, yeah, you're right. That's kind of true. They're kind of the same pattern in some way. And someone else comes along and says, oh, yeah, but you know why that is true, right? Uh, that's because millions of years ago, the sea covered that part of the land, and it left the soil fertile. And so when it receded, um, or the, the dead sea creatures made the soil fertile. Uh, and so then it was conducive uh, to cotton farming, which is associated with slavery, which changes the demographics of the place, uh, you know, 160 or 200 years later. And I think those kind of why questions, um, they're so much better and they're so much more interesting uh, than the questions that our data visualization is best at out of the gate, which is the what and the when and the where questions. And I think it's a lot of our job uh, to push even harder on some of the some of the why questions and why does this happen and why does this true and where is the meaning in it and I think those the knobs that we have to deal with that like about abstraction about uh, uncertainty and about uh, story those are the knobs that we have um, so I think I've got us back on time uh, and I, I I can take questions if uh, if you're interested and otherwise I'm looking forward to learning from you today. Here we are, here we are, okay. Hello, so um, some questions from the audience. You're not shy, we talked about that. Yes. Hey, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, you touched on it very briefly near the end, but um, not to be a cliche, but I'm interested in the question of the medium and moving from print towards web. Um, I'm a web developer and the New York Times has like a very renowned web development team. So I was wondering how the interface with them impacted how you think about data, representing it on a web page as opposed to a print page. Yeah, so uh, the switch uh, from uh, print to web opened up a ton of possibilities for things, right? Like you just have tools that you never had anymore. We can, before we can geolocate things and we can stream things live and we can like ask you to participate in things and we can sometimes we can ask you to draw your own chart. And so it opened up the possibility of the space, like that DJ board, like the space got even, even bigger. Uh, it, certain iterations of it also killed things, right? Uh, and so when I look at that last map where I'm like worried about it being like a here is some data, I've just built you this interface, like that phase of our work uh, lasted a super short time um, because mobile came uh, and there wasn't room on mobile for a bunch of buttons. Uh, and now actually, uh, you know, when we I look back at that work uh, from that introduction to mobile period, it is the mobile stuff, like I can begrudgingly say, that like holds up better because it forced us to constrain ourselves. It forced us to edit in a stricter way uh, than we thought we could do like on desktop at the time, where it's like I have a, um, mobile has also changed things about, I think it's ruined a lot of the classic ideas about like a great graphic 
uh, in great newspaper graphic in the sense that when you look at like the great prize winning newspaper print graphics, there's often this really interesting sense of hierarchy in them about like here's the most important thing and then here's some things that like support that idea and here they're all interconnected in some interesting way. Uh, mobile has wrecked that entirely. Like there's no room to do anything other than like scroll down, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, this change has you know, shaped a lot of, of, of what the work is and now, you know, uh, now at the times like uh, some luxury there's these things that we call like panel eights, which are like eight printed pages together. Uh, and now the like deep luxury of the, if you're in the graphics department at the times is to like get a panel eight because you have like a room to think and breathe again. Uh, and so like both, both things have like, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and I think the most talented people just understand what those are and can play with them um, in the right ways. Anybody else? Um, our, uh, um, our audience um, all over the world um, on YouTube are also welcome to leave uh, questions on the chat and we will read them and answer them. She will answer them. <laughs> There's someone almost all over the world, um, all the <laughs> way there. It's two time zones away. Hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever had any fear or hesitation about a visualization before you've put it out into the world. I certainly have had fear or hesitation about all kinds of visualizations uh, before we put it. I'm trying to think of what is a good example. Um, you know, I do, what's a good example? I'm blanking on the best story, but I think, you know, I spent the last six years and as an editor, and I do think the ratio of the time you spend thinking about why this could be right to why this could be wrong uh, is super interesting. And that a ton of work in the world would benefit from more time on the why could this be wrong uh, half of things. And maybe that's just my own, like, interest in uncertainty or interest, you know, but like, yeah, I think um, the, like, uh, I mean, or there's other types of things too, like, you know, like the needle election results that, uh, or that, that's sort of stuff that we put into the world. That's so scary because live stuff is so scary. Uh, and that like, you know, if it, if something is not okay, like you don't, there's not going to be enough time to fix it. And so like, I think that is probably like my true, like peak fear, uh, answer in the, the, like some of the live stuff, it's closer to like a performance in the sense that like, uh, if this code breaks, we've just like wasted six months of work and like nothing as good is going to happen, right? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and I think hesitation about, uh, sometimes the hesitation comes from more uh, more boring kind of answers about like, is this too hard or is people go, are people going to get it or is the complexity of this visualization worth the payoff? Uh, and so those are, those are some examples of that too. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you for your fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to know what do you think is the right balance between the news stories and the visualization that comes with these news stories? So one of the, the my last, the, the, the years that I was editing at the time, that at the times, um, one of uh, my gifts of that section was that uh, you know, basically, I was in charge uh, ultimately of both the both traditional reporters and graphics editors. So, like, we control the whole thing, right? Like, and you don't have to like negotiate with another department or worry about other people's fears or or things like that. Um, and so, uh, the balance of that, like, I, I think I in, in, I had the luxury of not of thinking that distinction is false, right? Like that we are all working together, we are all swimming on the same, uh, in the same lane kind of, of like, we are like crafting this thing uh, and the words will work uh, towards the visualization and the visualization will work towards the words. Uh, and often I think, uh, you know, like there's a, like, maybe not. It doesn't matter. 
um, both of you are you're going to make choices that are suboptimal for your own part because you want them to be like optimal together, right? Like so, you're not going to write the lead of the story you would write if you didn't know like this big graphic is going to go on top, uh, and you're not going to write the you make the chart you're going to make if you didn't know like oh this is the point that the words right next to it is trying to make, right? And so there's some bending of both, and so the the balance is not like. It's not a balance. It's like we're all we're all the same team together. Um, but I will say that I I've started this new job at this little nonprofit uh, that works with government data, uh, and they they have their template uh, the the work that they make. Um, they start with like this like poster image that's just like a throwaway poster image, and then they have a bunch of words, and then there's a chart, and I'm like, what are you people doing? Like when you have good visualization, you lead with the good visualization. That is like the core thing that I learned at the New York Times. Like if you have the good visualization, stick the good visualization on top, uh, and uh, so that balance is something that I think I have an opinion about. But otherwise, I think it's kind of like kind of indifferent, and it depends on like. There's certain things that graphics do. Graphics speak to questions about scale, about patterns. Um, there's certain things that words do. Uh, words can be fuzzier. Words can move emotion. Words can uh, uh, capture different types of information. And so the balance is what's the information that I'm trying to convey. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, I'm sure you've covered a really wide range of topics over the years. I was wondering if there was something that was especially challenging or strange that you never thought you would have to visualize, and if so, what was it? What a great question. Um, Yeah, there's all kinds. There's all kinds of things, especially you know, especially when you spend time like like beginning people do as sort of like a general assignment person, where it's like just like you're just thrown out like whatever, uh, whatever becomes useful to you. Uh, and so I think, what's a good answer to that? Um, I have always been fascinated about the sort of topics that you are allowed to say you're ignorant by. Uh, just because I'm thinking of that just because of where I am today. And so like, I think at the New York Times, like, you can be a respectful person and be like, I don't know anything about baseball, right? Like, I just, I know nothing about baseball. Um, I think it's a lot harder to be a respectful person like, uh, and say like, I don't know anything about Israel. Like, uh, and, but like, both can be true, right? Like, uh, and so uh, I think people who are really strong reporters, one of the things that I admire most, most about them is their ability to parachute, right? Like their ability to like figure out who it is that you should talk to uh, to understand this thing uh, right away. Uh, and it's also like a super dangerous skill because the people who are best at that, like often like they can fake it, right? <laughs> like, and so like this is a really dangerous uh, thing. I think some, for me, I think it's, you know, the range of like, now I know like esoterica about like how track and field records are captured or like I understand this thing about this like new type of micron bacteria that I wasn't understand before, but I don't have, I don't have a great like, Here's the weirdest, the weirdest example of a place I've been. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I'm here. I'm thank, here. You. thank you. <laughs> um, actually, this will be a kind of continuation of the previous question, because uh, during the walk in the New York Times, New York Times is pretty important, uh, right? As a, um, a pretty important uh, mag not magazine newspaper, newspaper for a lot of the people. So I'm just wondering, do you have a, uh, cases during your job uh, there uh, when your, uh, when the data visualization or any uh, articles which include data visualization uh, badly or maybe in a good way clearly affect the, pe the people's life, you know? So you can, after all of this, figure out that, okay, people are, have it uh, in a good or bad way and how it affects their lives. Yeah, I think uh, certainly uh, certainly we've made mistakes, uh, certainly in terms of mistakes of actual like technical mistakes or about things that are uh, just wrong. Uh, I don't understand this data in the right way. Uh, I did, or uh, lesser mistakes about uh, I, uh, I, um, 
wasn't clear as clear as it could have been. Um, the opposite example, I think you asked too about like, I think as as a organization, the Times is really proud of impact in the world, and so I can think of you know tiny types of impact. There's like uh, maps some of my colleagues made about uh, evictions, about like uh, what is the uh, how likely are people to be evicted from their from their homes? Uh, and the data was super messy. It wasn't really consistent across places. But the data like pointed one of our reporters uh, to go to a place, to go to a courthouse, uh, where she watched uh, people hiding their cell phone in the bushes outside of the courthouse uh, because they didn't allow phones in the courthouse. Uh, and the the answer was like, uh, just put it in your car. But like. If you're the sort of person who's being evicted from your apartment, a lot of them like took the bus, so they like didn't have a car to put their put their phone in while they went to while they went to court, uh, and that story like ended up. Uh, putting a phone locker in that courthouse. So it's like dumb and small, but I think the data points to a place that is like has a specific problem. Um, a more recent story, uh, it's about uh, prenatal tests, right? So tests that pregnant women take, um, and uh, they've gotten fancier now, so like there's many chromosomal tests, and, and you get these tests, and they have a lot of false positives for some of these disorders and conditions that are really super rare. Uh, and that's known, but it's not conveyed well, like, and that's showing that data, uh, and that is a story that has just like caused the FDA to tell some of these companies that like, hey, we gotta like think about like what claims are you making when you advertise these tests? And so like as an institution, uh, the organization is super proud of, of examples like that of impact, even when it's small impact, even when it's like you know one cell phone locker in one courthouse, like in one some silly place. It's a place where like the data reveals like something is wrong with this, and we could do something to make it better. Hi, <laughs> I have a similar question. Do you know what was the audience of the upshot? What was the audience of the, your data visualizations? Do, do I know? I do know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that we release those numbers publicly, like on a general basis, but you can see things. Um, there are times, like, you know, the, the company has released, like, things for election night, where I think it's like, you say that, like, I think the number, I don't know, it's a couple hundred million people or something will, will view the times in, like, election night. Yeah. I, meant, I meant not the numbers, but if there are smart people, regular people, rich people? Oh, got it, yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the Upshot is a tiny section within the Times, uh, right? Uh, and we're like, the brand of the Upshot is never gonna be different or more important than the brand of the New York Times as a whole. The New York Times as a whole like has, like it's a thing, right? It's been around for hundreds of years uh, and is a thing. So, but on balance, uh, our readers were not uh, particularly different from the Times readers as a whole. Okay, uh, I'm very happy to say we have a question from um, the audience at home. Um, Haya is asking, um, do you believe there is a political agenda behind the way you designed the visualization? I, I hope there is not a political agenda behind the way we design uh, visualizations, uh, and we, we want there to not be, or the, uh, we want the agenda to be that we are seeking truth and fairness. Um, you know, do I also believe as a person that we all, as people, uh, come with our own uh, sort of biases uh, and priors uh, and ways of looking at the world? Like, I also, I also believe 100% that that is true. So, uh, I want, and the, you know, the organization uh, I work for now, like, takes a lot of pride in being, in being nonpartisan. Um, you know, being nonpartisan is its own sort of framework about the world. Uh, and so I do think that like, uh, we, I will, I say we want to be fair. Uh, we want to pursue truth. Those are the most important things. Uh, and I also believe that we're all also like humans who have ways of thinking about things um, that can be different. Any more questions? Great, because I have a question. Um, so yeah, I was one of the uh, hundreds of millions um, refreshing or feeling a need to refresh uh, the real-time updating needle in 2016. Um, and, um, and it really made me m m unclear whether you're not only trying... So as, as you mentioned in your talk today and in, the, in our workshop yesterday, 
it would have been better for people to just go and watch the stars and wait for the answer in the in the morning it's not that they can do anything about the real-time information that is presented to them but I felt like this was teaching me something about uncertainty was that a part of your agenda maybe secretly <laughs> I mean you know that that may be my own particular bias um, you know there are times when we have deliberately tried to teach people about uncertainty I think of our some of our we did some of our own polling in the 2018 election uh, and we streamed that live uh, it was a crazy amount of work for what it was uh, but uh, it was it was phone it was polling by polling by telephone um, and so uh, the the idea is if you're doing a phone poll in America right now you have to call about like 30,000 people to get 500 people to talk to you so all I would say is like we called someone they didn't answer we called someone they didn't answer we called someone they didn't answer you know like for hours and hours and hours and hours on end uh, but I think that was like a deliberate attempt to teach about like why can these things be wrong in ways that you might not otherwise think about I think uh, you know I wouldn't say that like the, the live elections results I mean, I think there are lessons about uncertainty embedded in, in all of those things. So yeah, I think I, I'll, I'll change my answer real time on this one. I'll say like, yeah, I do think like, what do we know and how do we know it? Uh, those are classic journalistic questions that it's fair to answer and that like the, that some of the like, good answers to that can be used as teaching tools too. Great, thank you. Anybody else? So uh, join me in a round of applause for Amanda. Brilliant. <laughs>